readers, Rex and Heather. Would you briefly explain what cryptozoology and relict pomenology is and the kind of activities you might typically perform? Well, cryptozoology and relic pomenology are two fields uh, quite often regarded close together by some, but cryptozoology uh, is the search for mystery animals or species unknown to science uh, or, or creatures that are thought to be extinct but, but, but might still be around. Wonderful. And with uh, relic hominology, uh, that's to do with, of course, uh, relic, prime, uh, relic hominins, that is uh, human ancestors that are still with us, even primates as in the case of the Yeti in the Himalayas. Uh, or dweller among the rocks, as the word means. Interesting. And here in Australia, we have, of course, the Yowie or Hairy Man uh, in Aboriginal folklore. They were called hairy because they wore animal hide garments and uh, they also made stone tools and fire, which to me means that we're dealing with a, a form or forms of Homo erectus, our immediate ancestor. There's a giant form of about uh, 3.66 metres or 12 foot on the old scale, and we have an average human size type. Uh, then we have the pygmy type, the little hairy people of the Aborigines, uh, particularly of northern Queensland, but we have them down here in the Blue Mountains too. And the fourth type is a hirsute creature uh, which actually really fits the uh, image of the hairy man. And of course there's hairy women too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you for not but being sexist. <laughs> <laughs> but in this case, we're dealing with living Australopithecines. Mm. And Australopithecines migrated out of Africa at some stage and reached Australia. I have proof of it here in that 2.5 million year old skull. The only one, the only evidence bone-wise found outside of Africa of Australopithecines to date. And this is the first skull found outside of Africa and I found it, which, which, which I'm still proud of because <coughs> it shows that Australia has more than just an Aboriginal history. Yes, it does. The Aborigines came here by <coughs> maybe 50 to 60,000 years ago, excuse me, <coughs> and we have evidence in way of footprints here at Katoomba and other parts of the, uh, of the Australian continent going back a million years or two million years in early Pleistocene um, fossil deposits. So. When Australia was joined by a land shelf to Asia, it's quite likely that other races were able to walk in here mm. and evolve. And certainly Homo erectus came here and evolved into modern humans here in Australia before he did in Africa. Wow. And the earliest traces of modern humans go back at least four to 500,000 years in my fossil collection. There are footprints that are older in, in rock, uh, but certainly in Africa, Homo sapiens evolved from Homo erectus only 150,000 years ago. In other words, Australia was the birthplace of modern humans. So I believe, yes, that's wonderful. And the word Yowie, is that an Aboriginal word? Or? Yes, in fact, uh, there are other names written in different parts of the country in the different dialects, but in Eastern Australia, principally uh, from northern New South Wales to southern New South Wales and inland into the central west around the Orange area, uh, early, uh, early researchers uh, found the name Yowie seemed to be the most commonplace uh, name and it means hairy man or hairy people. Hairy. And so as I say, they were hairy because they had animal hide garments, not because they were covered in hair. That's nice to know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but we have this other creature uh, that uh, has joined the 
the, the group mostly, the Australopithecines, and they are hairy, and the Aborigines say that they were the earliest form of hairy man they knew. And so he's always been around. We have, for example, just west of the Blue Mountains there, Canangra Boyd Wilderness, uh, volcanic ash and mud flows, and after one of these cooled, somebody walked across one three million years ago. Mm -hmm. They left about eight tracks. They stop after two or three, turn and look to one side or the other, and in doing so have left one, two, three tracks, and then they've continued on uh, across the, the field of volcanic ash and uh, disappeared into the side of an embankment. And who was it? three million years ago in Australia to leave hominin footprints, it would have to be an Australopithecine. Uh, early Homo uh, is evidence for them almost two million years in Africa, but we have the same here in Australia. And I think that Australia had a separate evolution, hominin uh, evolution to that of Africa. And this is what I'm putting out in my books. Yes, that's great. So Heather, you're obviously on all of these expeditions. What are the type of activities you would typically perform? Normally I'm just there to make sure Rex doesn't get into strife, oh. as far <laughs> as if he falls or something like I've that. Only lost of late, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately I haven't been able to go into the bush as much as I would like because of my own physical... Um, when, when you were on the expeditions, were you... Um, I was there, I was in there, You yes. were with the little brush and brushing things away? Yes, yeah. usually doing the photos of Rex doing things. <laughs> so um, you're, you're the official photographer? I'm the official there photographer, but although Rex does most of his own phot photography stuff now. Wonderful. But yeah, other than that, sort of I do the after work. Yeah. So. At 72, I have no intention of retiring. Wow. I'll be 72 in a couple of weeks. You're 72. When did this all start? You were 14, oh, I believe. When I was seven years old, oh, my seven. parents took me to the Australian Museum in Sydney and I was never the same again. It was a hot Sunday. And I remember I found the insect collection. That started me. Oh. <laughs> my father was looking at a, a, an Asian woman over here and her husband, she had a dress right up to here. And, and he's fixated on her. I said, come on here, you. <laughs> my father. And so I was just uh, wondering, well, how does she get around like that? <laughs> I said, yeah, why has she got a dress to a mummy? And she said, oh, in, uh, in Hong Kong, they're up there, it's very hot. <laughs> well, man, was more interesting. But you were supposed to be looking at the butterfly. But you were that. captured by the insects, that. But is that I, right? At that moment, at that moment when that was happening, mm -hmm. I saw this big reconstruction of a head of the giant monitor was at Megalania and uh, I decided I'm going to look for fossils mm. when I'm older and uh, so I, my father ended up making me a glass case by 1956 when I saw I wouldn't give up insects. In fact, they made me my first butterfly net uh, and uh, an old natural up here in the mountains when we were coming up here on holidays on a regular basis. He uh, he taught me how to pin things out, probably how to keep uh, notes in the field and all that. Wow. And so basically I taught myself mm -hmm. how to make setting boards for the insects and everything, how to preserve them and whatever. And so I built up thousands of insects from all over the world gradually, but it's not just a collection. I collected something because I wanted it. I might have a whole glass case full of cabbage butterflies row upon row of male and female, top side, underside, and then labels telling you that not one of those butterflies are alike. Because there's, in nature you'll find with insects, particularly butterflies or moths, you put, you put two males or two females side by side and you'll see the markings slightly larger on one than they are on the other. Mm -hmm. And so that led me into genetics of insects and your fascination with it. I yeah. even wanted to have a butterfly farm up here but the local council said it was against town planning. And, and butterflies, uh, that's unusual. So, planning. so from yeah. that he then got but into... I've, uh, I've had to do my own research under difficult conditions all my life 
and uh, this is the in spite of here. that, I learned everything in the bush. I didn't learn it out of a university textbook. And I've had to keep notes even before I knew the name of insects when I was uh, even when I started high school, Liverpool High School, at the age of uh, 13 there, I was drawing pictures and colouring them in and, and uh, recording what I knew of the, the particular butterfly and bit by bit I found their names. I'm going to the Australian Museum collection and uh, getting the Latin names mm -hmm. and uh, finding out as much as I could there were no books available on Australian insects. We were waiting at the time. for you. It was we all were, British. We were waiting for you to write them. Well, that's it. They, yeah. they, they <laughs> finally started in the last 20 years putting things out. We still need a good book on Australian beetles. But my interests now have turned from amassing this huge collection uh, for science. I'm told because I have no degrees, my collection is scientifically worthless. Ridiculous. And what I am going to use my collection for now, the insects and spiders for example, is for um, conservation purposes. <coughs> I want to see, I'd like to see laws brought in to protect certain butterflies and moths. I want to see a lot of countries being wantonly bulldozed around Sydney preserved because they're destroying the habitats mm. of species that no one can understand why they're becoming extinct. They haven't got their habitats. When I was growing up, there were thousands of beetles and, and moths and everything hanging around our old farm at Lansvale. You go down there now, you're lucky to see a cabbage butterfly. And I want to see us do something about our heritage while we can. The Blue Mountains is pretty safe, but uh, it's too late for a lot of the species that were flying up here and laying their eggs. I don't know what's happened, but even the ones that were breeding up here uh, have taken a nosedive. We've got to do something about it. I don't know what it is, whether it's chemtrails or something, but I am now more concerned with saving my heritage, saving my environment, than just forming collections. Even the collection, uh, the stone uh, images I have of the sun god Bell and other things I found around Australia that show people were coming here 3,000 years ago. Uh, this to me uh, is important. It shows that our history is far older than Captain Cook. Mm. Cook used a Portuguese map to find his way here anyway. Mm. Uh, yeah. It's unofficial but he, he, he was given a copy of, a, of the Dauphin chart um, before he left England and that's why when he was wrecked on the Barrier Reef and barely made it into Cooktown Harbour. He, he charted a course for Cooktown, a place he didn't know existed supposedly, yeah. and writes in his logbook, the harbour was smaller than I had been led to believe. As uh, the American humorist Mark Twain said, the history of Australia reads like beautiful lies, but it's all true. Yeah. <laughs> if I could draw you back to your, your, your past past 20 years of work that you've done, out of that, those, that, those expeditions, what has been the most convincing piece of evidence you think you've found? In what field? Yes. That's the most convincing, <laughs> the most convincing evidence uh, for the Yowie is the comparison between, say, this footprint and a set of fossil ones out there on Narragin. We have fossil tracks which are identical to these, and which, uh, and this is a recent one, of course, so well, the, uh, the foot structure hasn't uh, changed as far as we know. Except for the size of it, it looks pretty human. Well, he's the it? larger fellow. Mm. We do have little yowies the size of me, and uh, the, the evidence is that structurally Homo erectus uh, um, and Homo sapiens, uh, our foot structure is much the same, mm. but the fossil evidence shows um, comparisons with the modern foot. And this is where I've, I made a discovery years ago that we're dealing with Homo erectus, and people were wondering what it was, a big hairy ape, oh, that's impossible. Uh, but 
the people that say it's a gigantic Pythicus must expect all Yowies run around on their knuckles <laughs> like a gorilla. And, and another, so, thing, yeah? another thing that we've found recently is live footprints. Foot, yeah. Footprints we, in, in soft soil that in areas where no hikers, barefoot. Like in Mullandilly Valley recently, yeah. um, well, March, where no hikers have we been. found an hour old Australopithecine tracks. In Amazing. Mud. There was it's rain here. the night before. There was a little pool yeah. of water, and the water was uh, it was right next to the water. It was very sloppy, and I left them? the plaster back well, in the car. Well, then the ground away. got firmer. But so one of these days, the fact is, they're moving around the Wallandilly, which connects with the Canangra Boyd Wilderness, and we have some vast country here. Any sceptics that say, "Ah, um, how can they possibly exist?" You know, well, I say there's plenty of room for them to exist in and to get out there is the problem to prove it. So I'd say anything could live out there and you wouldn't know it. The thylacine, the Australian panther, uh, we, we have, for um, example, we've got the, the thylacine, which I've seen at, wow. um, at, uh, at Mount, uh, not Mount Victoria, up at Blackheath on the night of Tuesday, 22nd of February 1972, at 10.15pm. It was in a car that I was being driven in. It was turn up to Evans Lookout Road. It ran across the road and stopped dead in, uh, in the headlights glare and looked straight into the headlights. So we pulled up. And all I could do was get a mental picture of it. As soon as I got home, I drew everything I remembered. But I saw a living thylacine disappear into the bush and down a gully that leads Cut a long story short, down into the Grace Valley. So was there, there an out expedition there. very quickly after that? Did you go on expedition straight away to see him? Well, uh, it was useless trying to chase him. Mm -hmm. But I have, yes, I led an expedition in 1984 um, when I got some people to help me uh, down into the, uh, the Grace Valley. But in more recent times, Heather and I have been. Uh, to Tasmania and four days before we had to leave I found tracks at Roseberry and I've got the casts at home. On the west coast of Tasmania. And just recently at Blackheath uh, on a bush track walking the dog I found in the afternoon tracks that had been made earlier in the day and the next morning I came back and cast them and I had them at home. Uh, the, the, creature's paw went in and the rest of the leg went down and that's a rarity and it left an impression of that and I was able to get that uh, that part of the foot with the extra um, Did you? what do you call it, corn that they oh, have there. The back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they okay. had that in a bit higher up and uh, or a claw rather I should say and that was embedded in the ground too so I've been very lucky and it proves that they're still up here but that they're still in Tasmania and my fight now is to make people aware of the need to protect the old growth forests Definitely. and uh, um, the Western Tiers for example and if they allow the government or if the government allows timber people to tear them away there goes a habitat for the last remaining thylacines and also other creatures that rely on that habitat uh, for their own survival. And uh, oh, so I'm into conservation, uh, heavily in, in insect conservation. I want to see conservation of creatures that aren't officially proven yet. The Australian panther is a marsupial cat. We Females have been seen carrying pouched young. And we have had multiple sightings in this area of that, haven't yes. we? Yes. I mean, um, they've been on, I'm sure I've seen film on actual TV that people have taken on their phones. I was within six foot of one one night <laughs> down in Kangaroo Valley on a rainy night. So I don't think we can it call that there, mythical. That me. is, <laughs> yeah. I, I retreat, made a strategic withdrawal to the gate here. <laughs> in case my theories were wrong and that they do attack. <laughs> but it went the well, other direction. Yeah. Um, they only attack, uh, they wouldn't attack, they'd defend themselves. The Blue Mountains Lion. I would run if I saw that. Now, that is a sketch I did in 1980. Wow, look at the teeth. That is teeth uh, to the front. And 
and that was based on people's descriptions. I'd been vindicated up at Riversley. Scientists have in the last couple of years found fragments of bones of a creature uh, smaller than that, that one there, but still with the sabre tooth and everything. The, mar the, the giant monitor lizard, Megalania priscarowan, uh, supposedly extinct several thousand years. Uh, that one has um, has a lot of the scientists uh, saying that oh, it's extinct. You know, people have just seen oversized uh, monitors, and they can grow up to about ten foot with the tail. The tail is very thin uh, and uh, comes to a minuscule point in perfect specimens. So that would add to the length. But this guy, thirty foot and three thousand pounds weight, well. Um, and maybe even if they're 20, 25 uh, foot in length on wild, the old scale, like whale size, what's that in whale. metric? But anyway, they are out there. We have tracks. The one I have there, um, that I think you photographed earlier, it, uh, it actually shows a creature of about, oh, 20 foot in length. And it walked across a farmer's uh, recently ploughed field he, uh, at Maruya, and he rang me, this was about May 1979, rang me about it and uh, we couldn't get down for a couple of days. And I said, uh, cover them with something to, uh, in case it rains yeah. and I'll come down and cast them. So we put a big old fashioned washing, tin washing tub over one mm -hmm. and lumps of grass over the rest. And it came pouring down, and the ones under the grass just got uh, ruined. They were still there when I got there, but they showed hardly any decent features. But the other one was perfect, and I made a cast of that. So they're out there. Yes. Uh, down in Victoria, Omeo in 1895, uh, one of these creatures appeared out of nowhere. Uh, probably from the, the Alps somewhere, crossed through the bushland that was still pretty thick then and uh, terrorised the whole town for a couple of weeks. It was seen on various farms. It uh, fed on the local poultry and, uh, and a calf or two and uh, a whole army of settlers banded together with guns and dogs and they went looking for it but it had retreated back into the bush. So. Uh, that's the last major um, sighting, major sighting of that kind uh, since then. That these animals have retreated as their habitat's been Has developed <laughs> further and further back. Yeah. This is the last retreat, the eastern mountain ranges. And this country here that developers thankfully uh, will not get into. And we're a national park. But I, I know that the there's reasonable populations of a lot of these creatures. My method is to get in there one day, look for evidence and get out. If you stay around, if you camp out, uh, creatures tend to leave. Uh, they'll, they'll think you're going to be there permanently, so they leave. It's and better, we're going in small groups. Yeah, going Not two, three people is my limit because uh, Big groups make too much noise, whether it's a yowie or a fire scene or whatever. They'll hear you coming for miles. They smell you too, probably. And mm. the, these expeditions looking for the yowie with four-wheel drives and <laughs> television people in tow that certain people I know have been guilty of, uh, they accomplish nothing because everything within miles, every bird, every creature will be gone because of the noise they make. And so you've got to be quiet in the bush. Even creatures are quiet in the bush. You've got to be if you're going to survive, so uh, if you're a, a creature. <laughs> with, uh, with that in mind, if, if any of our readers are budding cryptozoologists or uh, they, they are interested in becoming and following your research, what advice would you give them apart from only travel impaired? Uh, two other small groups. Well, small groups. groups. Mm -hmm. And as I say, Read up on your subject. Don't go bush bashing, oh, we're going to catch a yowie. You never do. Uh, I've got people who have tried to copy me for years. They do everything wrong, and that's good. Uh, <laughs> and so the creatures are still out there. But I, I'm against 
the person that thinks, oh, if I catch one of these, shoot it, you know, I'm going to get on television. Yes, you will. The court case should be interesting yeah. uh, if it's a national park. Yeah. Uh, and most of these locations are national parks. And my advice is that uh, for young people I'm aiming at, don't just think you're going to be able to go out there and find evidence, even footprints. Once you learn where to look, how to look, and if they want advice, come to me. I don't mind at all. I'm, I'm teaching one young bloke at the moment because I want to pass on my expertise to people who appreciate it, are sensible, and have no ulterior motives like, oh, if I catch one of these, I'll make a fortune or something. There's no money in it. And you'll find there's a lot of people who make fun of you. And these are the people that know nothing anyhow. And anyone that takes the trouble to do things right will have success in the long run. And it took me a lifetime to make many discoveries. Lately, things are starting to fall into my hands because I was, for example, looking for a lost megalithic temple for about 30 years based on a few of the uh, rock inscriptions I found of the Uru civilization, uh, as they call themselves. They left uh, a written script and here on the Blue Mountains, for 30 years it was mention of a grand temple of the sun god Nim. And it's only last August that we found part of it. We didn't realise it covered a whole ridge for a couple of kilometres wow. and is divided up into shrines and other temples uh, for some of the lesser deities. Uh, but the sun god himself is at the entrance temple and he's carved in relief out of the side of a cliff uh, and uh, where, he's where sitting there I'd love to see his it. head is about so Even thick I haven't seen it. and it's uh, it's pretty rugged bushland it's in the newsletter there Too much for but, me. <laughs> but he's sitting there holding his altar which you're supposed to put uh, offerings on ah, okay. but you see uh, I was looking for that for 30 years and I, I sandwiched the Kanangra Boyd Wilderness and one day we found it last August and I hadn't been able to get back there until was it April this year and then I had to wait for someone else to go in with me and another month gone and everything. I was able to get in about three trips this winter uh, to record it and we made a major discovery on the last trip of a, an astronomical uh, temple where you've got, a, you, you've got large slabs of rock leaning against a cliff, creating a cave about so wide. And there's, the only way they could have done it was put it down first and then put a big slab over it. But there's a, a platform with an upright pillar on it. And maybe on the summer solstice, the sun shines through there and hits that pillar. But, continues on through there and uh, and there's an opening up the top directly above it triangular opening between uh, the slabs of rock that are uh, allowed to be seen passing over uh, the, the, but that's getting away from animals I know but the point is but it's fascinating, 30, years so I don't mind. <laughs> pers 30 years of persistence yeah, mm. and I found it so I say to young people, if you're going to be studying anything like this, it could take years to make some discoveries, but don't give up hope. Go out there in the field and look, but do it sensibly, otherwise you get lost. Our bushland is very dangerous, uh, and uh, not for the foolhardy, but as I say, anyone that wants to know anything, contact the Gilroys, rexgilroy.com. <laughs> and, uh, oh well, that's that's a wonderful segue because my next question is about technology. How the last ten years for everybody has been amazed what well, has been an amazing leap in technology. How have you incorporated new technology into your expeditions or into just what you do? Or I'm, haven't you? <laughs> I'm looking for sensible young people, male, female, that are with, interested with in coming out and the rough stuff and looking. Can I speak? Yes. Basically, we haven't utilised technology in our searches a lot for the simple reason 
people ask us for the GPS coordinates for these uh -huh. things. And one of our things has been we do not disclose the exact location of things for fear of vandalism as in what has happened in Queensland at the Gympie Pyramid. Yes. So if we were to give people the coordinates, you'd have every man and his dog going in. And that's not, and particularly yes. places like the Canangra Void, it is a national park, yeah, it is a fragile national park. Know. The last thing you need is people going in off the road to this rugged bushland that is basically untouched. So it is a shame that we have to worry about things like that. I know, it? but I, you've only got to see what's happened with a lot of things. I trusted the local editor of the newspaper back then in 1975, show me and I won't tell a soul. Ah. This is the Gimpy? Mm. And he went away and put an article in AAP Reuter, you know, and they came pouring out of the hills. <laughs> he advertised it worldwide oh, and okay. said, uh, his excuse was, you have no right to hide these things from the world. Uh, and they came out there with their picks and shovels and they wrecked it. An 18 terraced, 200 foot high, four sided, um, well, flat surfaced, flat summited uh, step Pyramid. pyramid of the Old Kingdom period in Egypt, going back about, what, 3,500 or so years. And... Oh, I thought that was the pyramid. <laughs> and uh, what I was going to say, but yeah, that's something else. The thing is, the... Because I trusted this person, uh, I paid for it dearly because after that, the National Parks people came in and, and chucked everybody off. I was doing measurements, important work. Thank goodness I rescued a hell of a lot of stone images and inscribed stones uh, for study. But now I'm glad I did because of the vandalism that took place. There's hardly any, anything left to show it's a real pyramid anymore. But, so I believe uh, but the treasure hunters include one gentleman who put a, a grader through the north the east grader. face uh, to rip out the, the east side of the pyramid to make it easy to get to the treasure. There's nothing there. It's an astronomical structure. This and this is what happens yeah. uh, when you tell the wrong people. This is why I've got to keep a lot of my sites secret. Yeah. And so anyone that comes out and me, that's all I ask of them. But this is what I saw through persistence Back in uh, August 7th, 1970, I was out in Canangra, I was out in Jamison Valley, and 50 feet or so away, wow. this creature, hominin, yowling, was walking, working its way, working his way through forest, not 50 feet or so from me, and I sat there watching him in the late afternoon light and he just went from there to there with a digging stick and he did have one poke like that and pulled up a, a, a root of a fern and then kept on going, disappeared into the jungle. If he'd have seen me, uh, he showed no sign of that, but he, he certainly was minding his own business and I wasn't going to change, uh, change him. So I was privileged to see a yowl, a Homo erectus type, and that's basically what I saw. How tall? Um, well, about five foot ten, about my my height. So, um, a, a tall man, tall human. Yeah. So, and he, he was, he, he had no fur clothing on only, and that was August seventh. Still a bit cool, but uh, I had to get out of the valley pretty uh, fast because it was getting dark. But. I just climbed over Mount Salty for the first and last time in my life. It's pretty dangerous. But there's a lot of creatures. Um, we have Burren Jaw. We have a, a footprint cast there. I should have maybe. But you, you can see the, the plus cast of a younger Burren Jaw. Burren Jaw is a Tyrannosaurid relative, I'd say. And he's part of the Aboriginal folklore of Northern Australia. But I can't see them breeding up today uh, and not causing trouble on the outskirts of cities and towns. Imagine one walking into Bathurst or somewhere. Uh, so really, they're coming 
from another time dimension, I think. This is the only real possibility. It's my theory. I'm open minded enough to say it's possible. We're talking in And uh, they appear for a while and disappear. Uh, like a and uh, That's being that people have seen all sorts now. of creatures yeah. over the years. Well, but when we were in Central Australia, uh, we found a couple of years ago, we found, we found tracks. Really. They started basically in the middle of nowhere. They ran along and then disappeared. Then we and had one big fellow so that from one portal it's in the book. to another portal. Yeah. Uh, right, he had a track about that big a Tyrannosaurid type. And he was chasing a flock of kangaroos and he'd gone across the Sturt Highway, hadn't he? In the wee small hours, probably, I don't know. But certainly, uh, it, it, you could see the tracks going up the other side of the embankment through the, the, the soil. And he crunched through a big shrub. Uh, I don't know whether he got his dinner or not, but <laughs> it was hours old and I couldn't make a cast of it because it was too big, but I got all these smaller ones so when and we I photographed the others. When we find these footprints, particularly in sandy stuff like it was there in Central Australia, we take into consideration soil movement and things like that, whether it's perhaps a camel or an emu, and there's just no explanation for these things. And as I said, it starts and ends basically abruptly. As though it's gone through a, a portal it's a, an into like yeah. Uh, well, the Yao is very often associated with portals and it is a possibility as well because that yeah. once again um, possible that they've got plenty. They've at least got plenty of habitat. To There's live. more habitat, but yeah, so that they can disappear into. Some of the more famous or iconic footage out there is the pa famous Patterson Bigfoot footage. Mm. What do you make of that? I'm uncommitted on it because I've seen so many very good fakes and uh, this one it's been looked at by scientists and some have said uh, they're convinced others say no it can't be uh, <laughs> for one reason or other but it's uh, the movements once again say that you can see they some claim to see the baggy bagginess of the suit coming out. <laughs> Once again, it comes down to keeping an open mind. But oh. I'm not an American, I'm, I'm not used to the Patterson film. I've seen plenty of stills of it. You do get it on TV. It's, yes, it just I, seems to be I, I keep an open mind about yeah. it. Um, I have seen an analysis of it uh, by a experienced researcher who seemed to lean in the lines that it it is authentic. Dr. Grover T. Kranz, um, Anatomy of the Sasquatch. Yes, well, one of those. Yeah. 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 So he, it is a possibility. career on the line, that man. Mm. So, yeah. Before he died. No, there's a lot, a lot of dedicated researchers overseas. <coughs> but there's also the Get Rich Quick Brigade, the publicity seeking ones. And unfortunately, we've got a lot of those people in Australia trying to turn Yowie research into Bigfoot research mm. and uh, there's a lot of rivalry work. and so the, their interest has turned to discrediting the other bloke to get him out of the way so they can get more interviews on television than he is. Yes. This is ridiculous. <laughs> now we, we, we hit it in ufology <coughs> as well. Yeah. Yeah. Ufology is, uh, and sounds like you we all asked... go through the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. You I've got no time for that. I'm a straight out researcher and uh, I've, uh, I write down my observations <coughs> of me in the field. You asked um, uh, before what sort of, I can't think of the exact wording, but what would you say to young cryptozoologists? Yeah, anyone, sort of a budding enthusiast that wants that's to That's right. Take it uh, to, yeah. Is to do your reading, do your research. Yeah. Respect the bush, respect yes. the Australian bush. It, it looks innocuous, but it's pretty, um, can be, even experienced people have gone missing. <coughs> and you it's looked at Rex coming. then. Does that mean you, you've lost Rex occasionally yes. in the bush? he has been lost overnight. Rex, tell us. Overnight. overnight. Freezing, three degrees below freezing temperatures. 1999. So have you right. tagged him now? Like I tackled him. <laughs> tackled well, him when a thousand foot high. That's uh, why he doesn't go out uh, alone. Mountainside in pitch dark. 
and fell over a three metre cliff and uh, <coughs> pulled my, my right shoulder out of sight. And uh, if it wasn't for the freezing cold, which anaesthetised, I would have been in agony. But I, I, I got up and I staggered on, fought my way up to the top of the ridge. I was having hallucinations, but I kept my head together and I said, I'm not going to die. I'd sit down for a couple of minutes and I'd keep on going, but after a while, I was, I was starting to, you know, I was starting to uh, sit down longer and longer and I thought, if I do this, I'm going to freeze to death like Captain Scott. So I, uh, I kept on going and I got to the top gradually. I fought my way through some bushes and there I was on the ledge and, and I curled up under a little ledge, which I'm still trying to find this place. And I only had enough room for the body. Uh, the legs were out there. And I, had, uh, I, I had more hallucinations and I saw, oh no, I heard this bird twittering and I thought, ah, uh, if I can just make it through to, uh, oh God, I was cold. Uh, if I can just make it through to the sun up. Any